Basic Problems in Argument, Fallacies. We begin our investigation of problems in argument with a look at the problems caused by others. In order to be a critical thinker, one has to find a way to look beyond eloquent language and emotional appeals. And in that regard, one important thing to be aware of are fallacies. As noted here in Merriam-Webster's definition, a fallacy is, quote, an often plausible argument using false or invalid inference, end quote. In simple terms, it's trickery or errors in logic. Shakespeare famously wrote that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. You might also argue a fallacy by any other name would still stink. If you look for definitions of the dozens of identified fallacies online, you will come up with multiple names for each. It just depends on who is doing the naming. Originally, the ancient Greeks identified fallacies in the sophists' arguments. Remember, detractors argued that the sophists could make one believe black was white with their eloquent arrangement of words and faulty logic. Let's take a look at the 14 most common fallacies. The names I use for the most common fallacies to show um, you are different probably in other sources, some sources. However, if you learn the concept and to recognize the fallacy, whether it's called bandwagon or ad populum, to the man attack or ad hominem isn't critical. After all, a rose by any other name. First up is hasty generalization. If I argue that the Republican Party is the party of no, I'm encouraging you to ignore detail and look at a broad stroke. Looking at the list on this slide, you might note some hasty generalizations that are commonly used. An ad hominem attack is made when abusive remarks are substituted for evidence. If the attack is germane to the issue, it's not fallacious. For example, the faithfulness of a man running for church alderman is relevant. When an ad tries to scare you into buying a product, when a commercial tries to get a donation by showing a tragic little child, when a student argues for a good grade because he worked so hard for it, you are witnessing an appeal to emotion, also sometimes called appeal to pity. Be careful. Sometimes the appeal is fallacious. If the appeal is designed to short-circuit questioning and logic, it is a fallacy. The product may not actually do what the ad claims. The money donated might not go directly to a child. The hard work of the student may not have resulted in good work. An appeal to a tradition fallacy says, it should remain this way because it's always been this way. You must decide if it's fallacious or not. People often compare things to increase a reader's understanding. However, this can also be fallacious. First, the two things might not be comparable at all. Second, once this poor analogy has been made, the arguer may actually start arguing the comparison rather than the original argument. Here's an example of a false analogy, arguing by false analogy. Take a second and read it. The first false analogy is comparing Iraq to Vietnam. The second is comparing a terrorist to an insect. Finally, the arguer hopes to prove his point that terrorists should be sought out and killed in the United States rather than hunting them down in Iraq, where American intervention is unwanted, by using the logic that one should not kill a bug in his neighbor's home to prevent it from coming into his own. Whew! That's a stretch and definitely a false analogy. Here's another common example of false analogy. 
Being a football captain and a mayor are two very different roles. You will see many false analogies in the coming election season. This is one of my favorites. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's one of my favorites because students can never remember the name and I get very funny answers on the tests. But when two things happen simultaneously or one after the other, we tend to attribute, attribute one to the other. A good popular example is Jenny McCarthy's argument that vaccinations are likely the cause of autism. She bases her argument on the fact that autism cases have increased as the number of vaccinations has increased. Well, she may be right, but the evidence just doesn't prove it yet. All it shows is post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. A little bit more on post hoc ergo propter hoc. When this assumption is made about things that seem likely, we often believe it without questioning. For example, here an arguer says that television viewing increases violence in youth. Again, these things did happen one after the other, and it seems so likely that one resulted from the other that we may not question it. However, you can see the fallacy when we alter the argument just slightly. Both of these arguments imply cause and effect. This one is obviously ridiculous. But be wary of the ones that seem plausible but still offer no proof. You may have to look for the proof yourself. Straw man. A straw man is responding only to an extreme or exaggerated representation of the opposing view or even creating a false position for it. In other words, you create a position of straw so it's easy to knock down. Here's an example. We've taken William's desire to not fund attack helicopters and painted it as a desire to not defend our country. This is a straw man. The next fallacy that we're looking at is false dilemma, sometimes called false choice. If someone gives an argument that gives only two alternatives, look carefully at the options. Are there really only two or three or even more? A common one is in abortion arguments where we say people should have access to abortion or very poor, ignorant girls will be raising very uh, poorly cared for children. Well, that leaves a lot of other choices that perhaps the children aren't, that are having children aren't poor, that they're not uneducated. Perhaps an option is adoption. So be very careful and see if there are any more choices than are being presented to you. The slippery slope fallacy is often used in gun control debates. The National Rifle Association has, sought, has fought long and hard to keep AK-47s from being banned based on the premise that it is the beginning of a slippery slope toward outlawing all guns. Is this a valid fear? Take time to consider the evidence of all slippery slope arguments. Anytime you see a celebrity promoting something, it is likely a false authority. I mean, is George Foreman really an expert on grills? Boxing, yes. Grills, doubtful. A non sequitur, and I've heard this called mad leapies. Non sequiturs are leaps in logic. The examples above are obviously fallacious. Take a second and read them. However, like post hoc ergo propter hoc, they sometimes seem so logical that we may not question them. Everybody knows that. When we justify bad behavior by pointing to other bad behavior, the fallacy is called two wrongs make a right. Next, I want to show you a fallacy called avoiding the question because I really can't explain it any better than this video. Please ignore the um, technical quality of it, and I'm going to move the microphone right now. But 
there's also some little snide remarks that the poster put on there, but I, I couldn't find it except on the BBC link, which I couldn't in, import into this program. So um, just listen to what the gentleman says. This is avoiding the question. In the current climate of suspicion about politics, your Deputy Chairman, Lord Ashcroft, a man whose peerage you lobbied for, saying that he would become resident in Britain for tax purposes, can you just tell us, is he resident in Britain for tax purposes now? I have no reason to think that he's not complied with the commitments that he gave. That is not the same as an assurance that he is. It's, uh, well, it's the truth as I know it. I've have you asked him? No reason to think that he hasn't complied that he gave, and whenever I've discussed it with him, I've, that is the conclusion that I've come have to. Have you asked him directly? Yeah, I've, I have discussed it with him, and I've no reason to have think you that asked he hasn't him? complied. With Did you say to him, are you resident of Britain for tax purposes? I said to him at the time that, of course, I expected now. him to fulfil his commitments. Yeah, have you I've asked no him? no reason to think that he hasn't. Have you asked him whether he's complied with the requirement that you said he would comply with? that I expected him to comply with any requirements and I would be very surprised if he hadn't done so and hadn't told me you about it. You seem surprisingly uncurious about such an important matter. I'm not remotely uncurious about it. There well, then why no, don't you ask him? There, there is no evidence that Lord Ashcroft has done anything I'm not ask, wrong. I'm I asking no you for evidence you. I'm asking for evidence from you that you have at least been intellectually curious enough in this current climate to discover whether or not your deputy chairman is resident in this country for tax purposes. As you know, I'm a rather intellectually curious person, and I have no reason to think that he hasn't complied with the requirements. And yet, you've never that asked him. Entered into. You've never uh, asked and, him. And I have discussed the matter with him, and I've made clear the expectations. You got in the peerage on the basis that he would become resident in this country for tax purposes, and yeah. you've never and asked I've just him. Given you the answer about that, I certainly have no reason to think he hasn't complied with that. Why don't? You Woo! What do you think of that? Well, get ready. You're going to see a lot of that in the upcoming election, I'm sure. That's called avoiding the question. Is there any doubt that that's what that is? Circular reason, reasoning, um, which is a form of begging the question, is another fallacy. Um, circular reasoning assumes a proposition to be proved is already proven in the premise. Read this example. In this example, Sylvia wants reassurance that God exists. Jeremy points to the Bible. When Sylvia wants reassurance that the Bible is accurate, Jeremy points to God, a God he has not yet proven exists except by pointing to the Bible. This circle can go on and on and on. There are more fallacies but your head will spin if I give them to you. The important thing to remember is to think. Don't let emotion or eloquent words override your cynicism. Be critical. Um, learn these fallacies, though, because if you should actually identify fall a fallacy, all the better as it will save time in helping you to evaluate at least that part of the argument. And it may clue you in as to whether the source is to be trusted or not.